Um, let's just do it. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the uh, last lecture in our nuclear civics lecture series. Um, I'm Hendrik Schatz uh, from Michigan State University. And I will tell you about isotopes in the multi-messenger astronomy era. Uh, my goal is basically to tie together uh, some of the other lectures you heard already. If you heard them, if not, it'll be fine. Uh, but if you did, then hopefully some things will ring a bell. Anyways, I'm going to share my screen. And I just want to point out that, uh, and there'll be also one of the points of my talk that nuclear physics is really important to understand astronomy. Hey, Anna, I, I just started. I hope that's OK. Yeah, that's OK. Sorry, I got disconnected. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess uh, everyone has, most people have uh, that have attended the previous lectures have already uh, met you. And uh, for the new people, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, we're happy that you're joining us, and we hope you enjoy this last lecture. And he, uh, Hendrik, is also talking about graduate school. Okay. Um, as I said, questions. Could we have this. Oh no, you, you're still. I think there's something with your connection. I'll. We'll just go. Yeah. Well, go ahead. You. you. <laughs> yeah, the, the sound is, is a bit choppy. Um, anyway, so nuclear physics is important, and that's why I like to start with a picture of a detector. Um, I think detectors can also be beautiful. It's not all the astronomy. Anyways, so what I want to talk about is the question of the origin of the elements, which uh, by now, um, if you heard the other lectures, uh, you know already that that's one of the key open questions in this field of nuclear astrophysics, and I'm going to talk about it. This is a history of the universe and some nice picture form on the left, the Big Bang, and then time, as time moves on, stuff emerges, uh, galaxies form, stars form, and uh, planets form, and people form, and so we're sort of at the right end here. and. Um, um, what we're dealing with is with the question of um, the elements at the time of the Big Bang. The periodic table of the elements looked like this. So um, three elements, um, that was the choice that was available. Um, uh, anything you had in this world had to be built from hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And lithium is really only present in trace amounts. So. Um, this is not a very interesting universe, but as you know, um, if you know from your chemistry classes, the periodic table of the elements today looks like this. And um, it's actually a complete table. So it, it shows all the elements that exist um, and all the elements that could exist. And one of the things that is fascinating to me is that any possible element nature actually found a way to make it somewhere. And you can find it, if it's stable, you can find it uh, in the solar system and, and on Earth. And uh, we just want to know, for each one of them, where, where, where did they come from? And how did nature manage to get us from here to here? Um, so uh, I want to start with this. This is kind of the textbook uh, understanding of the origin of the elements. So if you if you have a textbook on nuclear astrophysics or uh, related, uh, maybe nuclear physics book, that's what it probably will say. Um, so the lighter elements, we mean usually up to iron, but really it goes a bit further than that. that these are made in stars, and we understand that quite well. Stars shine. Uh, that means energy is generated, and that means uh, nuclear fusion happens, and that must create uh, these elements. Uh, the heavy elements, starting germanium, that's a bit more difficult. And uh, the understanding is that these are mostly uh, created by neutron capture processes. And there's sort of three processes dominating. The two S processes, a, slow, uh, a main and a weak S process, 
and they happen in low mass red giants and in massive stars with a little bit touch up uh, when the star explodes. And that is, I won't say well understood, but uh, we kind of know where it happens. And we see the freshly made nuclei on the surface of these stars, so we know uh, the S process happens in them. So, so that's kind of okay. But that only explains about half of all these elements. It doesn't explain the heaviest ones. Um, basically, everything past uh, bismuth. Uh, no, I forgot. Oh, yeah, sorry. Here it is. Bismuth. Okay. Anything past here um, can't be made in the S process. So there must be another process, and that's the rapid neutron capture process. And that is the big question mark uh, that has been around uh, since 70 years. And we still haven't figured out how that works and where that happens. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. That's the big open question in nuclear astrophysics. OK, so um, how do we know uh, that process exists? And I think, I sorry, uh, before I get there, um, I just want to point out that um, this is one of the 11 greatest unanswered questions in physics. Um, you know, if you, if you as a scientist, you work on something, <laughs> you try to jump on those things. Um, and uh, this was a nice article. Um, and uh, one of those 11 questions is what I'm working on. So I got really excited. Um, and uh, that came out, um, I think, around uh, when the new century started, 2000, and uh, we're still working on it. Anyways, um, so I, I would like to walk you through the argument of why we think there is an R process, and it will show you the interplay between nuclear physics and astrophysics that really defines that field. And uh, without the nuclear physics, you, you couldn't do anything. Um, and before I do that, I want to start with the first poll and just want to understand how familiar you are with the concept of the chart of nuclides. Um, Anna, I think you have to do something, right? There it goes. Okay, so just how familiar are you with, with the chart of nuclides? And you can be honest, um, that would be good because uh, that will determine, your answer will determine how much time I'll spend on that. And remember, uh, there is another t-shirt to win from active participation. Okay, last chance. Okay, here are the results. Okay. Very good. Okay. So then do I have to do something? If you still see the, 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 the screen with the poll, just click on X. Okay. okay, so this is a pretty even 50-50 split. So I'll spend some time explaining that concept. Uh, that's good. Uh, so um, nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. Okay, and principle. Oh, okay, here. And, and, and so uh, the chart of nuclides is this kind of table here, um, where you basically just uh, display um, the number of protons versus the number of neutrons. Um, so the rows here are certain proton numbers, and the vertical columns are certain neutron numbers. And any nucleus you can think of is, is a square uh, on this diagram, and it's a combination of protons and neutrons. So, for example, uh, let's pick uh, uh, this one, for example. You see the mouse pointer? Um, so, this one has, you know, yeah, 36 protons and 50 neutrons. Okay, and that's that square here. And, you know, you can whatever your favorite number of protons and neutrons is, there's a square uh, that you can draw. Uh, not all possible squares are drawn here. So we don't think all of these nuclei exist, uh, but which ones actually exist uh, can at least hypothetically be created um, is an open question. So where the boundaries of this is, is not clear. Well, what we do know is that if you look in this room or on earth, uh, there are only, very specific combinations of protons and neutrons that produce stable nuclei and stable atoms. And, and those are the dark black squares, okay? 
So the one I just picked, uh, well, it's blue here, and we'll get back to that later. But um, let, let's go one up. That's a black one. So that's uh, 37 protons, right? And still 50 neutrons. So that's an isotope that you can actually find in your room right now. Um, no, I should have picked one that I know what, what uh, 36, uh, 37 is um, rubidium, I believe. So this is an isotope of rubidium that has 50 neutrons. And if you have rubidium in your room, there'll be that isotope. Okay, uh, does that make sense? Um, I don't know, it would be great to see your faces. Um, so I hope even the people who haven't heard of it, uh, yeah, I hope the concept makes some sense. Um, the other concept that's important is uh, what's called the solar abundance. So that's the, so that's the nuclear part here, that chart. Uh, the astronomy part is the thing on the right here. And um, that is uh, basically showing for each of these stable squares, how much of that can be found in the solar system? So not all of these stable squares are, um, are present in a solar system with the same abundance, okay? And you can actually see this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, this is the mass number. So this is the sum of the protons and neutrons. So our example here, uh, this rubidium thing has 37 protons and 50 neutrons. If you add those two numbers up, you get 87, right? So the mass number of this square would be 87, and that would be somewhere here. Hmm, there's 87 here, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I guess here, right? So one of these wiggles here, that's how much of that isotope is present in the solar system. So people have figured this out from um, analyzing the material on the Earth, but that has undergone some changes. They also have to look at spectral lines from the sun. Uh, the sunlight tells you uh, the composition on the surface of the sun. And then there are certain types of meteorites uh, that you can find in deserts or in Antarctica uh, that have, um, uh, that are remnants from the formation of the solar system that sort of preserved the original composition of the solar system before all the other stuff happened. And uh, you piece this all together, you get this curve. And certain isotopes and also certain elements are more abundant than others. And the heavy ones, uh, so this is iron here, right? The origin of the heavy elements, we talk about this, is those up here. Okay, and now we have to put these two things together because you probably notice there's some structure here. Um, there are these peaks. So there's some elements that are extra abundant some of the heavy ones, uh, barium and lead, and xenon and platinum. And believe it or not, that tells us that there's an R process. And, and I'll explain how that works. Um, is that what I wanted to do? Okay. Okay, so let's first talk about those here. Uh, strontium, barium, and lead. Um, sorry. And uh, we can, you can go and find these on the chart of nucleids, okay? So we'll find uh, the strontium, the barium, and the lead. Uh, we know their mass numbers, 88, 138, and 208. Uh, we know strontium has 38 protons, so we have to go here to 38 and uh, count uh, to um, 88 uh, mass number, which is 50 neutrons. I hope that makes sense. And there it is, and I made a big blob, so it means there's a little square underneath, okay? So the, that, that's where these are. So what do you think? You, do, do you see you see some structure here, something that these three have in common? I don't know, do you guys, can you say something? Like, can you unmute yourself and, and give me the answer? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? The question is, those are these three isotopes that correspond to these three peaks in the abundance of the solar system. Do you see any reason, any special feature that these three have in common that it could explain why they are special? Do you understand the question? 
Evan. I do understand the question. I'm just trying to come up with the right answer. <laughs> okay. Well, there could be many answers. Uh, what do these three blobs have in common? They're forming a linear relationship. Uh, sort of, yeah. But, you know, you could form other three groups of three that would do the same. It has to do with other stuff that's on this chart and you may not know what that is, that's okay. But, do you know what I mean? Come on, students, what's special about the, the N equal 50, the N equal to 82, N equal to 126? Anything that kind of jumps off the page and bites you on the nose, so to speak, from chemistry class? Well, you don't need to know it, but these are marked, right? I marked them before, right? <laughs> so this is what we have, and if you put the composition of the solar system together with your nuclear physics chart, you get you get this coincidence, right? And I was hoping that you would see that there are these strange lines at each of these. Does everybody see that? Yes, sir. Now, isn't that strange? <laughs> So what, what are these lines? Those line, lines are called the magic numbers. And um, as well said, this, this is a bit similar to chemistry. If you, if you remember your chemistry class, um, there are electron orbitals, right, that you can fill. And if an orbital is filled with a certain number of electrons, you form a noble gas. And that noble gas really doesn't like to accept another electron. Um, and so it's particularly inert. And it's just the same with nuclei. Uh, there's certain numbers of neutrons that you can add, and then you create a, a closed uh, orbital. And these are sort of the noble gases of nuclear physics. And they just don't like to accept another neutron. OK? And of course, people knew about magic. They're called the magic neutron numbers. <laughs> They knew about these neutron numbers. And uh, then when they saw this distribution here, they, they did exactly what I did. They, they drew these blobs and they said, oh, look at that. Um, so um, that's why we think that these isotopes are being created by adding neutrons, okay? And once you added enough neutrons to form, let's say strontium-88, that's kind of a noble, noble gas-like nucleus. It doesn't like to accept another neutron. So stuff kind of piles up here and you make a little bit more of that than uh, for the others. Okay, so all's good. So we know there's a neutron capture process and it probably makes uh, those uh, heavy elements, but what, what the heck are these other peaks here? Platinum and xenon, those are in the wrong spot, right? Now we can make blobs for those as well. Now we. Let's assume those are also made by neutron capture, okay? So they must lie on these lines here, but so where would they end up? And uh, this is where they would end up. So if we had neutron capture um, with isotopes out here, uh, we would certainly accumulate um, these uh, mass 130 nuclei and these mass 195 nuclei. Now, the problem is those squares are unstable. So they shouldn't really exist unless they're freshly made somewhere. But okay, so that's that's the hypothesis. Um, let's say we have neutron capture, and you just you know if you would add neutrons to uh, this nucleus here, you could certainly add neutrons and add neutrons until you reach uh, this uh, cadmium 130. It's an unstable nucleus that lives uh, has a half life of 160 milliseconds, so it's pretty short lived. It'll decay. Uh, this one actually we don't we don't even know what the half life is so that's something we want to figure out with Efrep uh, with the new facility. Um, 
But uh, so that's the idea. So there is another process. And instead of these stable isotopes, it produces these unstable isotopes. And we could just see this by putting these two concepts together. Now there's a little problem here. Um, if I just take the, uh, sorry, uh, if I just zoom into the chain of cadmium isotopes, so that's this row here. So just take this row of the chart of nucleids. Uh, that, that's that row. Uh, here's the stable isotope of cadmium. And then if I add neutrons, I get uh, heavier and heavier isotopes. And the one we think is being made somewhere in the universe by neutron capture is cadmium 130. Now, the problem is, um, you, you can make cadmium 130 by neutron capture if cadmium 129 captures a neutron. Okay, so, well, where does the cadmium 129 come from? We don't know, but let's just assume somehow we've made it. Um, uh, we can certainly capture another neutron and make our 130 cadmium. Uh, the problem is we need to have enough, we need to be fast with the neutron capture, right? Because this only lives for 154 milliseconds, these numbers here are the half-lives. So uh, before this decays, we need to capture a neutron. I, I hope that makes sense. And now you can do a little bit of math. Um, <clears throat> so basically, the, you can calculate the time it takes to capture a neutron. Uh, and that depends on the neutron density. And this thing in the bracket, that is the, uh, what we call the neutron capture reaction rate. So that's the nuclear physics quantity. If you had a certain amount of neutrons, what's the likelihood that the nucleus likes to capture the neutron? Okay, and um, we know the capture time has to be faster than 154 milliseconds. Um, and we know what this uh, nu nuclear physics can even calculate that. And we have measurements now for some examples. Uh, so we can guess what that is. And it's supposed to be of the order of 10 to the five, uh, whatever in those units. So we can solve this for the neutron density that we need to make the neutron capture fast enough. And you know, you just reshuffle this equation, put in the numbers, um, and to get a, a capture time of at least 154 milliseconds, you need a neutron density that's larger than 10 to the 19 neutrons per cubic centimeter. Are you still with me? Did, did you fall off the chair? I hope you did. This is crazy. 10 to the 19 neutrons per cubic centimeter. Well, I don't know, is that a lot or not? It is crazy. Um, why is that so crazy? Well, that's a bit the question. Um, we can, let's look at what we've achieved in the laboratory. Okay, um, people put neutrons in bottles. And this is one of those bottles. Um, they're pretty uh, expensive, large scale experiments. And these are the densities they've achieved. You know, 1,000, um, maybe 10,000. I don't even know whether those numbers have been actually reached or whether they're planned. So um, a few thousand, and that's sort of the, the leading edge of the field. So uh, even a few thousand neutrons per cubic centimeter is a major feat in the laboratory. So why is that so hard? I mean, I can buy a bottle of protons at eBay and they're, you know, the 10 to the 24 protons in there, but um, I can't buy a bottle of neutrons. And if I go to Los Alamos, I get these feeble numbers. So uh, why is this such a hard problem to come up with a way to have that many neutrons per cubic centimeter? I need some answers. I, I was hoping we, we do this a bit inter interactive. You could just say what you think. Why can't you buy a bottle of neutron, uh, neutrons on eBay? Uh, is there no way to bound the neutrons? Sorry? I'm guessing because there's no way to bound the neutrons like independently, maybe. Like to keep them together or? Uh, essentially, yeah. That's right, they would just pass through the wall um, <laughs> because they're so much, they're like 10 or 100,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom, right? Because they don't have electrons. It's just a neutral particle. 
So it would just pass through the bottle. But there's even a bigger problem. Uh, that, that wouldn't be such a problem in astrophysics. You could hold a large bunch of neutrons together with gravity, like in a star. But there's another problem with neutrons. Anybody know? Is there a safety issue? Uh, yes, there are safety issues, but why? Why are neutrons so bad? Is it because they can cause damage to the body? Yep. They do damage to the body. That's right. And so part of the reason is that they that they pass through everything, um, so they can penetrate your body, and then when they get captured, but they also do something else that's bad. We have some um, comments in the chat. Somebody says they are too small. They penetrate matter, or they yeah. are radioactive. They're yeah. radioactive. <laughs> exactly. They're radioactive. That's the other reason. So two reasons. One is. One is Everybody's right, <laughs> but they're radioactive, right? Neutron decays with a half-life of 10 minutes um, into a proton. So when we buy a bottle of proton, I mean, this could be protons from the Big Bang. They're, they're still around. Um, the hydrogen in the solar system is from the Big Bang. Um, and, you know, you have plenty of time to create some astrophysical site or uh, some uh, intelligent life can create bottles and you just put it in and uh, it's not going to go anywhere. But the neutrons, you only have 10 minutes, uh, then it's gone. OK, so you, you can never accumulate. So th this neutron bottle that I showed you is at a facility that's actually creating those neutrons fresh from scratch. And then you just have 10 minutes to accumulate them. And you know, as they decay, you have to put new ones in to keep the density. So. We need to find a place in the universe where 10 to the 19 neutrons per cubic centimeters are made from scratch. Okay. And that has been the problem. We haven't really come up with a whole lot of ideas. Um, and uh, you need to go to quite extremes. And um, it's really just really hard to figure this out. Um, and I want to show you two, two ideas. Uh, so one's a, a supernova R process. So can we make 10 to the 19 uh, neutrons per cubic centimeter in a supernova? And the answer is maybe. Uh, and here's how that may work. Um, now, if you forgot what a supernova is, so they're stars, right? They, they burn nuclear. They have nuclear reactions that create uh, elements and they create iron in the core. And um, this iron accumulates and they can't. Oh, OK. <laughs> the iron accumulates in the core. And eventually, this iron core gets so large that gravity wins and the whole thing collapses. And when it collapses, eventually, um, it gets squeezed enough uh, so that the protons and neutrons hit each other. And then there's a. Uh, uh, um, uh, I was, uh, kind of reflection and uh, a shock wave goes outward and uh, explodes the star. Um, okay, so it contracts and there's this explosion. And uh, hold on. Oh, I'm already in this movie. Okay, let me try this again. But it's okay, it's okay. So iron accumulates in the center, becomes too much, gravity wins, contracts, protons and neutrons bounce against each other. The whole thing explodes, gets really hot. There, there we go. And uh, you don't wanna be there. And then a remnant forms, there'll be a neutron star and it'll be extremely hot and there'll be material 
still coming out and that's where we think maybe an our process happens and I'll, I'll show you the microscopic view. So here's again the iron getting really heated up and when you heat iron high enough that's uh, let's see um, 10 even 20 maybe 30 billion degrees uh, it just splits up into protons and neutrons. So those are the protons and neutrons. The protons are supposed to be red and the neutrons are supposed to be blue. So um, the stars spent 100 million years or so uh, making all this iron and then it's all destroyed in the supernova. So that's kind of sad, but um, as we can see, we can build heavy elements out of the stuff. Now, uh, iron has roughly equal numbers of protons and neutrons. And so this is a mix of roughly equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Now, um, at, at the high temperature, where are they? You see them? You see the little white streaky things? If they hit a proton, it becomes a neutron. Isn't that cool? Who knows what that is? What particle can magically convert a proton into a neutron and a neutron into a proton actually? Anybody know? Oh, no, I don't see the chat. Can, can I? I am monitoring the chat. Oh, actually, I, I opened the window. Can someone write in the chat what particle that is? Is it a quark? Uh, no, no, not a quark. The, the quarks also kind of preserve their. Um, a neutrino. Excellent. Yay. That's the right answer. So there are tons of neutrinos because that that newly formed neutron star in the center is so hot, it just creates neutrinos out of nothing. Uh, neutrinos and antineutrino pairs, and they bombard the stuff that's now flying out, uh, consists of protons and neutrons, and they, they tend to make more neutrons than protons. And so you end up with a soup that now has more neutrons than protons. And now things cool and new nuclei form and they form in pairs. Uh, protons and neutrons find each other, then those form helium, and then those heliums come together carbon, and they form heavy nuclei, okay? And they kind of form iron again, or um, elements like iron. So you may say, well, we haven't, <laughs> what's the point of all this? Um, we spent 100 million years to make iron, we destroyed it all, and then we reassembled it, and there we are. But see, the difference now is we had, because of the neutrinos, we had more neutrons than protons, right? So all the protons pair up with neutrons and there are all these neutrons that are left over. So it's not just iron here, it's iron and tons of neutrons that didn't find any protons. And that's what you need for an R process. And you, you see how twisted the scientific mind has to be to come up with something um, to make that work. Um, so that's one idea, and we can see how that works. So now the R process starts, the neutron capture process. So the lonely neutrons are still flying around, and then they get captured by these iron nuclei, and you make neutron-rich isotopes that are unstable, and eventually they will decay. And in the decay, there you go, a neutron will become a proton, and a new element is made, because the proton number is the element number, right? So we have one more proton, we have one higher element, and it just keeps going like that. More neutrons and uh, should be another decay. There you go, another element, and you just keep going like this. So that's kind of how it works, and somehow this cadmium-130 isotope will be made like that, and it will also decay, but um, a little bit more of that will be produced because of the magic number, and that's why we see that peak in the solar system. Okay, can you do a poll just for the fun of it? Are neutrinos important for the R process? Please click on, oh, there you go.
Okay, last chance. Okay. Okay. Now this one has a right answer and the right answer is number three. They convert protons into neutrons. It's not number four. I know I made it sound very reasonable. I, I tried hard to come up with something to, to mislead you. I'm sorry about that. Um, but no, they do not uh, stabilize uh, the nuclei that are formed. Um, those still decay, but they do convert protons into neutrons, uh, which is an essential step. If you don't do that, you just make iron again and nothing else. Yeah, it was a trick question, <laughs> sorry. Well, you want to have some fun, right? Um, so actually, I'm, I'm proud of myself. Anyways, let's, let's move on. Um, any other ideas? Where in the universe are lots of neutrons? Um, There are actually stars that have neutrons in their names. Stars. Well, the sun, yes, but it doesn't have neutron in its name, right? Neutron stars, excellent. Neutron stars, they're basically giant balls of neutrons. Um, uh, they're extremely dense. So here's how you would make a neutron star. So you take the sun. Okay, the sun is uh, 300,000 times more massive than the Earth. There's a the little Earth. So imagine you take the sun and you shrink it into the volume of the Earth. And you have to press really hard. Now, if you would do that, you would still not have a neutron star. You would maybe have something like a white dwarf. Um, so you're going to take the Earth-sized ball, the Earth-sized uh, ball of sun material, and you compress it further to the size. Uh, well, I use here Lansing. Um, I, I didn't know. I mean, you guys come from all sorts of different places. But well, basically, your favorite city. Um, you compress the sun down to the size of a city. That's basically the density you would have for a neutron star. Um, one of my favorite analogies is a tablespoon of neutron star matter um, weighs as much as about 10,000 aircraft carriers. Isn't that cool? So, and when you compress things to, um, to that small size, um, they become neutron stars. And here's uh, kind of a, a nice picture from Danny Page on uh, all the interesting things in a neutron star. But I, I don't want to dwell too much on that. I think Jocelyn talked a little bit about neutron stars and they have some interesting stuff in their interior. Um, um, I just thought I, I, uh, I'll do another poll uh, with some trick questions. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. So what are neutron stars made of? Um, You know, Okay, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Should do more polls. Okay, so um, options were only neutrons, mostly neutrons with some protons, mostly neutrons with some protons and electrons, all of the above, and some crazy stuff in the center. Um, one of the answers would be quite weird, and that's number two. Why would that be weird? Because neutrons are neutral and protons are positively charged. 
And so uh, this would be a star that would have a huge positive electric charge. Um, and, and that would be pretty crazy. Um, so it's not that. Uh, only neutrons? Well, uh, let's, let's ask the following question. And you may have wondered maybe, why do neutron stars not decay with the 10.2 minute half-life like the neutrons? Isn't that weird? And, and they don't, they, they just sit around for millions and millions of years and the neutrons are happy. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, they're not fully made, they're not entirely made of neutrons. It's not the, gra the gravitational force just keeps them together, but they would still decay. Now, if they decay, remember they emit an electron and become a proton. Uh, some of the neutron actually have decayed and created protons and electrons. That's why a neutron star cannot be made entirely of neutrons. So there's a small fraction of protons and electrons. And the thing is, if you squeeze electrons together enough, they block uh, the decay. The, you can't uh, emit another electron. Um, the, the dense electron gas basically blocks uh, the decay, which has to emit an electron and it can't because it's a quantum mechanical effect. I don't know if you, if you had quantum mechanics already. So I, I assume you didn't. Uh, if you did, this has to do with uh, the degenerate electron gas. So the electron gas is degenerate. And so um, all, the, um, all the possible energy levels are occupy, occupied at these densities and uh, the neutron wants to emit an electron, but it can't because there's no phase space uh, for the electron available. So um, that's why we need a little bit of protons in there to stabilize things uh, and electrons. And it is actually true that uh, this, uh, everything I said refers to sort of the, um, the um, outer, uh, core of the neutron star and the inner core is made of some crazy stuff uh, that we still don't know what it is. So uh, the last answer was actually the right one. Anyway, so the neutron stars have neutrons that are stabilized. So that's all good. Uh, the problem with that was always, how do you get these neutrons out to do uh, an R process and then um, end up in some planet? Uh, and uh, the answer is neutron star mergers. So these are two neutron stars that uh, merge. And I'll show you that. And uh, that's a simulation. Uh, they, uh, so what's happening is uh, there, a lot of stars are in binary systems. If both stars undergo a supernova and end up as neutron stars, you end up with these binary neutron star systems. And then they just keep orbiting each other and they do emit gravitational waves. So the system loses energy and they get closer together and eventually they touch and that's what we call the merger. And um, Jocelyn talked uh, about this a lot. And when they merge, you can see there's some material at the edges here that sort of gets, gets flung out into space. And that's the neutron stuff that gets thrown into space and um, you know, some neutrons decay, you start reassembling nuclei, just like in the movie that I showed you in the supernova. And uh, that's where we think uh, maybe the R process happens. Um, okay, so um, I'm going a bit slow, but that's good. Um, um, let, let me just summarize uh, briefly how we, so we, there are possibilities, <laughs> scientists are creative. How do we know? what the right answer is. And uh, there are uh, a few pieces that need to be put together. So piece one is observations. And uh, one of the such observations are um, observations of the composition of very old stars. Um, it's basically getting a solar system composition that I showed you, but getting it for an ancient star. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that in the solar system, the S and the R process are all mixed together. But in the really old stars, uh, um, you basically try to catch them once they got polluted by the first process ever happening, making heavy elements. 
And so you see basically the original composition of an individual process. And uh, people discovered uh, basically uh, old stars that have exactly the pattern uh, that you would expect for an R process. So you basically subtract the S process from uh, what you find in the sun and uh, you get uh, what you think should be made in the R process. You plot that as a red line and it matches exactly the data points in the star. This is again, how much you have. Now this is not mass number, this is atomic number. So these are the different elements that you find in the star. Anyway, so Anna uh, told you all about this. Um, so that links back to, uh, to her lecture and uh, tells us a lot about the R process, tells us there is actually a unique R process event. It's not a mix of lots of different stuff. Uh, it's probably rare and it started to occur early in the universe but so those are hints, but not really answers. It's just something else we have to explain. Um, so what else can we do? Well, we could observe, sorry, I'll skip over that. Oops. Um, yeah, let me, uh, there, okay, let me not skip over it. Um, now, th these are not the only stars that you can find. Um, if you look for these old stars and look at their composition, there's some that have an R process, but there's some that have really strange patterns that nobody ordered. And we, we had no idea that these processes would even exist. Um, this is not an S process, not an R process. There's nothing we know. Um, so, and that's relatively new information. And so there are millions of these stars now and, and thousands of these patterns. And they really uh, tell us a story of how nature one by one enriched uh, our galaxy with, with fresh elements. And these kind of capture um, this chemical evolution uh, processes. And so I showed you the uh, idea that we have on the origin of the elements given on the textbooks. And this is sort of the new picture that's emerging. You remember there were only three processes in my original slide. So this is the current picture. So um, again, the light elements we think we understand, but the, the heavy ones are much more complicated. There is actually two groups, what we call the light heavy elements here in, in magenta and in green, that's kind of the heavy, heavy elements. And uh, they're probably made in different places. Um, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven possibilities, and they probably all contribute in some way uh, for the for this magenta region and uh, even for the heavy heavy elements we have at least three uh, possibly four or five um, yeah, there are many other ideas uh, uh, candidates and again there is evidence that it's more than one type of process um, so after we've made a lot of progress and um, nuclear physics and observations um, but we haven't found a solution. We have made the problem more complicated, which is great. I mean, this is much more interesting and it's great for you if you wanna get into this field because there's just a ton of stuff to do. Um, anyways, um, uh, we can also try to observe um, element sites, element creation sites in action. That's the other option is very difficult because they're so rare and because the heavy elements, remember those logarithmic uh, scale in the solar system abundance, they're very, very rare. And so even if you see a supernova, it would be impossible to observe the um, our process elements in there. Um, but we figured out a way um, and that uh, is thanks to gravitational waves. And Jocelyn said, told you all about this and I don't wanna uh, say much more, I'll just skip over that. So we, we see uh, from these observations that neutron star mergers are actually um, uh, creating heavy elements. We don't know which ones. So um, uh, we uh, don't see signatures of individual elements in these neutron star mergers. We just see that there must be heavy elements. Anyway, so we're left with the third, which is my favorite. We need simulations and nuclear physics. and um, this is again our chart here, and this is actually a simulation of a neutron capture process. And what we did is we took all the nuclear physics that we know, and I have to admit that uh, most of the nuclear physics of these unstable isotopes isn't fully known yet. 
this is something we need to do at AFRIP. Um, we know the half-life here, for example, but we have no idea what the neutron capture rate is. Um, we don't even know the half-life of this one, and, and the half-life is kind of the easiest thing to measure. And so um, we put this together, and for the things we didn't know, we asked the theorists to do some calculations, and those may be right or wrong. Uh, but then you do the simulation, and you see this is a supernova model, but it looks kind of similar to a neutron star merger as well. And uh, you can see how, uh, basically I showed you that movie, how the neutrons pile up on the nucleus and there's a decay. Uh, then there's a, a new nucleus formed. Oops, I'm sorry. So th this basically does that simulation. The color is how much of each iso isotope is there. And so you can see that those decays kind of slowly build up heavy and heavier elements and neutrons keep piling up. And uh, you also see that um, you're kind of making nuclei in these red uh, squares. And you also see that when, when you cross these magic numbers, you get uh, these abundance peaks. And so that you can compare this then with those broad-based observations. And then this will tell you um, how much of each element is being made in a particular site. So you do a model for merger, you do a model for neutron supernova, you do a model for anything you can think of. You take all the nuclear physics and you compare with the observation and with this curve here. And if you get the right elements in the right proportion, then you maybe have found the right site. And the problem right now is that we don't have the nuclear physics to really do that. Uh, it could be all wrong. And so um, that's why we built AFRIP. And that links back to Chris Reed's lecture. Um, uh, AFRIP will help us get that nuclear physics, uh, get that half-life that was missing, and get those neutron capture rates. Um, and I don't. I, um, Chris, Chris told you everything about um, uh, AFRIP. Um, I'll just show you, uh, I'll just remind you really quick because I like this. Um, I spend a lot of time on this animation. So this is my animation of how AFRIP makes our process nuclei. Uh, so you see the big blue blob, um, that's uranium. And uh, there's a bottle of uranium and that uranium gets accelerated. Hold on. You see that? Isn't that cool? Um, it impinges on a rotating carbon target rotating because there's so much beam power that everything would melt. And so this is rotating to stay cool. And uh, when it hits that target, it just fragments into pieces. And we have no control of what these pieces are. We just hope for the best. We just hope that, um, you know, we do this a billion times a second and uh, or a trillion times a second. And uh, maybe once an hour, there's a, the our process nucleus that we're interested or once a minute, if we're lucky. Um, and then we have a separator that separates the one that we want uh, and sends it to an experiment. And what we can do, for example, we can stop this uh, uh, nucleus, this our process nucleus in a detector and we can wait for the nucleus to decay and that time difference tells us the half-life. Now, what does it really look like? This is how it looks like. This is an actual experiment. Uh, beam comes from the back. Um, there are actually two detectors. Uh, so there are two decay stations. Uh, so one week we ran on this one and the other week we ran on this one. This one is my favorite. So you, you stop uh, the uh, particle in a detector in there and uh, what this one does is it, it does not uh, just count the time until the decay. It also tells you whether a neutron was emitted in the decay, which is really interesting. Um, anyway, so I'll tell you a little bit about grad student life. I think we still have a few minutes. I hope that's okay. Um, so um, students at MSU, certainly uh, Kirby, uh, one of the, my students put this together. Um, I want to skip this. Um, and um, I just want to know, let's do one more poll um, to figure out whether you actually want to know anything about grad, graduate student life.
Okay. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a grad student. Um, I don't know if I would do a good job, but I'll try. Um, so, well, as I said, you can build stuff like this. This is experimental nuclear physics. Um, it may look scary, but I think um, this can be done. These students here, they're, they're um, aligning the magnets, for example. Um, so you have to put them in, in certain positions. Uh, this is a separator that we built. So, um, so this is kind of the fun part. Uh, and then you run the experiment. The experiment takes a week or so, and then you sit for a few years in your office and you analyze the data. It's not quite as bad, but um, you participate in other experiments. Um, so it's kind of a mix, uh, but I mean, you're not standing all the time in the lab, but I mean, a significant part of that. This takes uh, probably a month to set up. And so um, uh, we'll keep busy. This, this is how it really looks like. So, so this is Rahul um, actually uh, getting the counters for the neutron detector. Uh, to the experiment site. Um, that's Afrib in the back. Um, this is uh, grad students in their offices. I just walked around and took some pictures. Um, and this one's a bit, uh, it, it's from, from the brochure. Um, but anyways, <laughs> um, so you can see uh, happy grad students. Um, and yeah, we have a mix of all sorts of people with all sorts of interests. Um, people are interested in science careers, people are interested in industry careers. Um, there are all sorts of things you can do, of course, and there are all sorts of people. Um, that's obviously a theorist here. You, you spend a little more time on the blackboard and in the lab. Um, some thoughts about grad school. Um, I think one thing to think about, of course, is about your career goals. Um, is, is graduate school really needed? Um, I read that number about 20% of grad students stay in academia, so the majority doesn't. Of course, uh, that, that doesn't mean um, by uh, no means that, that that's not necessary. There uh, is a huge range of amazing jobs in industry and national labs um, that open up. Uh, with a PhD in, in physics uh, or uh, nuclear physics. Uh, but of course, uh, it takes about five years to do a PhD, uh, can also be six or seven. Um, and now it, you will get paid. Um, I look at my uh, recent proposal and we put in 30K per year uh, for grad students. Um, it's not quite as much as you would get, of course, you would just start working after your bachelor. So one has to think about that a little bit. It can be quite stressful, and uh, it, uh, but it does open up a lot of new possibilities. Um, in terms of requirements, these are kind of my personal thoughts. If, if someone asked me what's the most important thing you must have to be successful in, in a physics uh, graduate program, I would say it's the uh, scientific curiosity. Um, that will be your source of self-motivation. And if you have that, you're good to go. Um, anything else, like any deficits in undergrad training, that can be all addressed, that can be figured out. We have, we have systems in place. Um, if people struggle with the grad courses, um, they can take undergrad classes, or uh, this can be uh, resolved in other ways. Um, um, but um, you got you to gotta be motivated because um, uh, as I said, it is stressful, and um, th this will this will get you through, and it will also help you um, um, be successful in the research. Um, if you would ask me, what's the one thing I could do <laughs> to get my education in shape uh, to be successful in grad school? I would say programming class uh, or programming experience or both. Um, if you can do that, you get a head start. It's not required if you don't have a lot of students that come here and have never programmed, and it does work out. But if you have the chance and you do that, it, it will be really helpful. Um, and programming is something where practice helps. Um, you know, if you have an issue, a, a deficit in quantum mechanics, uh, that can be kind of fixed by just taking the class. 
Um, but with the programming, uh, the experience will really help you. And then of course you need a successful application. Um, most schools take a holistic view, MSU does. Um, they look at the entire package. So, uh, you know, lower grades are not a disaster that can be compensated. Uh, the one thing that helps is research experience. And that goes back to the scientific curiosity part. In the end, grad school is not about the classes uh, and what you learn in any classes. It's about the research. And uh, when we hire students, we want to know that they'll be able to do the research. And uh, nothing better than having some research experience. Um, but again, if you don't have that, it's not necessarily a disaster either. Um, I would research the department, the group you want to work with, and tailor the application, each application to that information. And uh, of course, well prepared applications are important. And if there's interest, we could have an event on this. Um, you could let me know, or Anna. Uh, we were discussing this at times. So should we do that? Uh, we could have someone come and, and tell you what you should and should not do um, for a successful grad school application. Um, how to choose a grad school is just my thoughts. Um, uh, the research is the important aspect. That's, that's what it's about. So that's what you should think about. Um, of course, there's science you're excited about and science you're not so excited about, but you have to keep in mind your exposure to science has been limited. There is, uh, uh, my opinion is any field in science has interesting stuff. And so it's good to be open-minded and not be too narrow in that. Now, I think what in the end is more important is to choose the research group and your mentor. So if you're interested in a certain area, look at the school, uh, find a group there that looks interesting and try to find out about that research group. Is that a group I would enjoy working in? Contact the group leader, students in the group, uh, is that a well-respected group in the field? Um, you know, you can have the most amazing university, but, you know, you could end up in a crappy group and, and vice versa. <laughs> there could be really amazing research groups um, in universities that maybe are not top ranked. So, um, and it doesn't really matter what the rest of the, it's, it's not like a business degree or so where everybody looks at the sound of the school. Uh, it's really the research group and how well it's known. Uh, that counts. And, and then I would also say more important than the actual research area is the type of work you would be doing. Think about, do you want to build equipment? Do you want to use equipment? You just want to analyze data for three years uh, and a computer. Um, do you want to do theoretical work, computation modeling, and then look at where you can do that. Um, you will be invited to visit uh, usually, and that's of course the best way to figure out if if the place is for you and what, what to do. And here's some things how to apply at MSU. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested. Um, and there are other names here that you can contact. Um, but um, I'm done and Anna, Anna's telling me to wrap up. Um, and as I said, if you're interested in uh, maybe a little session on grad school applications, you have one, one person that's interesting interested, uh, let me know. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your time. If you want, you could type more questions and uh, Another count this for the t-shirt, so there's your chance to beat everybody else. I will announce the, the winner of the t-shirt later this uh, week, but um, you need to ask a couple more questions. We don't have to, this was nicely interactive. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, you can also type them.
uh, what research opportunities do you have? Uh, in my uh, group, um, the, um, the R process, what I talked about, is, is uh, really a hot topic for AFRIP. So that's, that's definitely a major research opportunity. Um, so the uh, decay experiments that I, I mentioned, those types of experiments, uh, we can do that with AFRIP for, we had a program at NSCL, we can do them at AFRIP. Uh, with a whole range of new nuclei that really get us into the R process. Um, so that's an opportunity to uh, build new detectors there and um, do the measurements. And then also um, in my group, I like to mix theory and experiments. So everybody who does an experiment also runs models to understand what the result actually does in a simulation of, for example, an R process in a supernova explosion. Um, but I'm also interested in accreting neutron stars. Uh, we do a lot of experiments uh, related to that. Um, I don't know, you saw those magnets uh, that the students were aligning. So that's a big construction project that did, but just was completed. But um, there's a big separator that we still don't really understand how the thing behaves. And so there's a lot of work to be done right now. Um, and it, it's a really unique time, I think, uh, an instrument like that isn't built every day. And uh, this is kind of the time where you can get data, but it's still very interesting. Nothing's routine. You have to figure stuff out. Um, uh, and those measurements will help understand things like um, X-ray bursts and uh, the composition inside neutron stars. Um, but there, yeah, there are lots of opportunities and uh, that, that would just be me. Um, we have uh, at least five other faculty doing uh, experimental nuclear astrophysics. Um, and then we also have uh, a lot of people doing theory. But I, I'm always happy to talk. Um, I talk often with prospective students um, so just shoot me an email if you're interested and want to know more. Uh, th this will be posted, Anna, right, the slide? So, yeah. um, I will uh, post a go back and look. Um, There is, of course, a website, um, at, at the AFRIP website, I don't know how to go back, sorry. Uh, there <laughs> the was, there has a tab on, on graduate students. Yep, there was a link in the slides and the slides will be posted on the um, lectures website shortly. And I will email you all who register with the link and also the link to the video so you can watch all four lectures. Yeah, this is a good question. How would you, how would one find a mentor and where would you recommend starting? Um, I think you wanna, you wanna look at the research groups at the place you're interested in, uh, talk with, you could contact students in that group. They're usually very happy to be helpful. Um, you could contact other students, I mean, any student probably knows something about every faculty member. And you can just figure out what you think would be a good match based on that. Um, if you get into that grad school, you would start and then um, um, you would, uh, you can start in a group and just see how that goes. Um, so at MSU, uh, we start people right away with research. Sometimes or often you come the summer before the program starts and you start doing research already. And then you're part of the group and you will see within a few months or so whether this is working out or not. And then it's not uncommon that people just switch and, and wander around and, and, and look. Um, now, another good thing is a research experience. So if you can do an RU, at your favorite place, we have RU, we have SROP is another program. Uh, the nuclear astrophysics research internships um, uh, that we're offering in the spring 
uh, another option. Uh, you can get a feel for uh, how the group operates and whether you, you, know, you, you think you can work with the person or not. Um, I would not recommend to just look at how famous a person is. Um, yeah. And also I would say, um, you're not stuck with one mentor. Uh, I always recommend people to talk to many faculty and uh, you know technicians, other people in the lab uh, can be mentors, of course. Um, so spread it out. Um, do you guys have opportunities for students to start like a new research idea? Like I understand that you can do research under someone like based off what they're doing, but there are there any opportunities to like start something new? Uh, you have to work under someone, but that doesn't mean you have to do what that person does. That person just has to be willing <laughs> to supervise whatever you want to do. So you can certainly pitch new idea. I mean, if someone pitches me an idea, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, I, well, if it would have nothing to do with nuclear acid physics, I would, I would maybe say, well, let's find someone who can co-supervise it or, right? But um, th that's what it's all about, having your own ideas. Now, even, even if you do what the group does, doesn't mean that there's no room for new ideas. There's a huge space, even within that defined scope, um, there's a huge space for, for new ideas and, and things that could be done. And I don't know any faculty member who wouldn't love to have someone come up with new ideas. Um, so you just have to find someone who's willing to, uh, to go for it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Should one have background knowledge on the subject? Uh, I, I had this list of things that one should have, uh, and uh, I put curiosity on top, and I deliberately didn't put knowledge on there. Um, I, I think you can learn, well, first of all, I think you can learn anything you need to know. And, and second, uh, no matter what knowledge you have, <laughs> you will quickly get to the limit of it. And then you have to learn anyways. I mean, I'm learning every day. Um, so uh, that, that's part of, of doing research. You're at the cutting edge and there's really, um, you know, that your, your past knowledge is of quite limited uh, use. Um, so in terms of research, I would say uh, anything can be learned. And I, uh, we work in interdisciplinary uh, areas. Um, so for example, I have no training in astrophysics. Uh, and most people in nuclear physics have either training in nuclear physics or in astrophysics. And you cannot take a full graded curriculum in all the fields that are relevant. You need to pick it up through your research and through learning through your research. And so no, you don't need background knowledge. You just need to be really interested in it. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's, that, that would be my opinion on that. And I mean, mo most research areas, probably there is no way to get the background knowledge, right? I mean, I don't know if you have a course in nuclear astrophysics at your university, probably not. Uh, very few places have, so. And then the graduate courses, they, they kind of start over anyways. Um, I mean, there's some basic knowledge uh, that is helpful that you learn in the courses. And of course it helps if you have a head start, but um, that's not necessary either. Okay. okay. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to email either Hendrik or myself, and we will do our best to answer them. 
Okay, well, thank you, Hendrik, and thank you everyone who attended. And uh, we hope to see you again in our future programs. Check out the website and uh, the videos on the YouTube channel. Um, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Have Bye. a good Thank you.